Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Alex Flood. The success of virtual ward meetings has administrators with the City of Thunder Bay excited about public interest. And this week, Council voted on a recommendation to solidify the format for the rest of the year. Attendance at virtual sessions yielded an average of 48.6 people, well above the number who regularly come in person meetings. And that's only part of the picture, as analytics aren't available for Shaw and T-Bay Telecable viewers. With the uncertainty brought on by COVID-19, the topic will again be brought to Council before December 20th to see if the in-person meetings can begin in the new year. McIntyre Ward Councillor Albert Aiello was the lone vote opposing the virtual format going forward. I don't like the virtual thing. Um, I've had successful virtual meetings, um, but there's an aspect of, of, of our role as councillors I feel we really miss, and that's the... Uh, the face-to-face -face contact uh, with our constituents. It's the small talk before the meeting and after the meeting. What we've received so far from individuals asking questions has been excellent. We received thank you for asking my question. You know, that was efficient. Uh, folks on the phone have been excellent uh, with our, our main floor staff who've been managing the phones and the email during the virtual meetings. Um, so I would say from that perspective, I've never received a complaint about a virtual meeting. There was interest expressed from some members of council to use a hybrid model at ward meetings in the future. And Wednesday was a historic day for the Laxul First Nation, which saw land that was used and later abandoned by the Anglican Church be returned to its original caretakers. It marks the latest step towards reconciliation with the community, which recently won an appeal in the Supreme Court of Canada regarding the land they were flooded out of almost 100 years ago. Adam Riley was there and has the details. On a remote point of land on the north shore of Lac Sewell, accessible only by boat or a very long off-the-beaten-path detour, sits the former Anglican church, the former residence of its minister, and a small cemetery, which is home to the remains of many former Lac Sewell residents. For years, the land has sat abandoned, but now is back under the stewardship of the Lac Sewell First Nation after the band purchased the land from the church for $11.00 in a move Chief Clifford Bull is calling an act of true reconciliation. I think the, the church for offering that amount and I think for, 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 for them to show that is a good gesture and a, a way towards reconciliation and healing for all the things that have gone wrong in the past for Indigenous peoples across Canada. Dignitaries from various organizations and government agencies toured around the land carefully doing their best to avoid stepping on a gravestone or final resting place before the dedication of a plaque to commemorate both the event and the location. Reverend Canon Dr. Murray Still, representing the Anglican Church, says walking the grounds and touring the structures gave a reverence of the past and agrees with Bull. Repatriation means that it, the people can now restore these grounds, these lands, and do with them as they have done for centuries and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, find their way back to, to living off the land that, it, that is now theirs once again. It's an exciting time for the, for the Laxul people. It's ex an exciting time for the church to be involved in real reconciliation. Plans for the land are still in its early stages, but Bull says with assistance from the Anglican Church and the purchase of an underground radar system, the community plans to locate and identify the bodies in the cemetery, as well build space for residents to visit family who were interred there. Adam Riley, TBT News. Meanwhile, after being cancelled altogether in 2020, the Emo Fall Fair returned to its agricultural roots last weekend. An entrance fit for fair royalty was greeted by hundreds of people, as one of the largest parades in recent memory concluded its drive through the town. With no amusement rides this year, a number of old-time staples brought visitors from across the district to Emo. Exhibition halls showcased prizes for local crafters like knitting. And, of course, the food is always a draw, while equestrian events brought some action to the weekend. Fair Committee Chair James Gibson says the event was greatly missed by the whole community, especially the youth. Well, it breaks in the summer up for them, too. They have the fair and then they go back to school and kind of breaks the summer up, you know, when people haven't been out for a year and a half, it's easy to come out and talk and it's easy to be entertained after a year and a half. It left a hole in our community and it definitely was not, uh, uh, it was missed, but it was something that we just had to get by with and uh, 
and uh, due to what happened and with the COVID and whatnot, but glad to see some normalcy back. Gibson says they couldn't afford the insurance that having rides would require, as they usually split costs with Dryden and Thunder Bay. Dryden was hosting a similar style fair this weekend as well. And as the excavation in Afghanistan continues, the window to get allies out of the country is closing quickly. But a local retired corporal who served in Afghanistan managed to bring his interpreter to safety with the help of Thunder Bay Rainy River candidate Marcus Pulowski. The man arrived at the Thunder Bay airport yesterday evening. For the sake of protecting his family members that are still in Afghanistan, will refer to the interpreter only as Mohammed. Robin Rickle, who served three tours in Afghanistan with the Canadian forces, alongside Pulowski, helped organize Mohammed's escape. And while it's a relief to see him now on Canadian soil, Rickle notes there are many more families like Mohammed's that are still left behind. Their story is the, the literal tip of the iceberg. And most of those families are still submerged under the Taliban in Afghanistan. They're, they're going to have to get settled. We're going to have to try and find some accommodation for them. And then the, uh, the work of starting to, uh, to get people ready for school and that, helping, uh, helping set up language classes for, for the family and whatnot. The recent terror attack at Kabul's airport has left many in the country scrambling. It's unclear how many more entrapped allies can be rescued from Afghanistan safely, but Rickards and Pulowski's team will continue to work on getting more of them out. And gas prices in the capital jumped another five cents overnight, approaching $1.40 per litre, and one expert says to expect even more price increases across the province for the rest of the year. Dave Charbonneau has the details. Prepare to pay more at the pumps. A lot more. I think it cost me about $55, $60 last summer. And now? About $75. And only going up. Ottawa could be paying this time next week. Uh, as kids get back to school, um, we could be looking at a buck forty-five, buck forty-seven a liter. Gas expert Dan McTeague says it has to do with supply outpacing demand, with prices rising south of the border and impacted by the Atlantic hurricane season. When it comes to demand and supply, America reforms price directions for everybody around the world. Saturday, Ottawa saw prices in the low 130s, a high price that some now consider a deal. I've been traveling between Petawa and Kingston, and I find that uh, that's actually a pretty good price. Everywhere else, it's about 137, 138. I think it's too high for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Just... Well, if I want to drive my car, it's, a, it's almost a luxury now, but... I have to expect to pay it, yeah. McTeague says many oil producers are not fully up and running following the pandemic, which is also why supply remains lower than usual. If Ottawa reaches $1.45 or higher per litre as expected, that would be a new record here. The capital's previous high was in June 2014, when gas peaked at $1.42.9 per litre. $1.45? $1.45 next week. I don't think I have any option. That's why I'm filling up now. <laughs> what can I do? You have to drive. Just pay it. McTeague also says there will be another price hike in January of 2023, saying the federal government's clean fuel standard could see another 15 cents per litre added to the price of fuel. Good days of uh, lower prices unless we face economic collapse uh, are, uh, are gone and not to come back anytime soon. Dave Charbonneau, CTV News. Here in Thunder Bay, local kids got to have their first bus ride before the start of school at the 28th First Rider program where parents and their children got educated on all of the procedures of riding a school bus. The fun learning experience of the First Rider program helps prepare children and parents for riding the school bus to and from school as well as on field trips. The 28th annual program ran today from 10 this morning to 3 this afternoon where they had 10 sessions throughout the day and two buses would run and two would be sanitized per session. Consor cons consortium manager, pardon me, for student transportation services, Craig Murphy says there was a total of 450 students that signed up to ride the bus for the first time today. You know, the first day of school can bring a lot of emotions for both the child and the parent. Uh, a lot of appreh apprehension about what's going to happen that first day. And certainly uh, for many students, their first experience on the first day of school is, is getting on the school bus. And it was a learning experience for not only the kids, but also for the parents. We talked to one parent, Gemma Chunuk, about why she signed up her child for the first rider program. 
So it's kind of like a sample first day of school for me too. Um, and it's just approaching so fast. And the fact that this year has just whizzed by and everything's just been kind of up in the air and there's no certainties. Um, this is kind of something comfortable to come to and we know that they'll be ready for that. As this was a one-day event, Murphy says if you haven't signed up for bus services yet, parents need to contact their school to request busing for the coming school year as the cutoff is August 31st. And it seems that I don't have my script, pardon me. Uh, fashion today was on display in Thunder Bay's North Core with the Back to School Fashion Show. It was on the corner of Cumberland Street North and Red River Road, which hosted eight local businesses showing off their back to school styles. The first of its kind event brought fashion downtown as the multiple local businesses showed off different perspectives of fashion coming together to collaborate in one event. Host of the event, Mary Wokema, is in partnership with the BIA Waterfront, which allocated the space for the event to take place, and multiple models strutted their back-to-school looks to the onlookers. Wokema explains how a new generation of fashion could be coming to Thunder Bay. It's amazing because, you know, before, before now I haven't really, I have seen Thunder Bay fashion, but I haven't seen it like this, you know, so I would love to see more of this. Um, so this is it's extremely exciting, especially for someone who is new to the scene. This is incredible for sure. This was the first fashion event hosted by Wokema, and she hopes that this could be an annual or seasonal event that continues to expand and bring in fashion from all over the world. Join now with Kurt Black. Kurt, why weren't you at that fashion show earlier today? You could have been strutting your stuff over Lots there. Lots of work, as, as just as you have had today, Alex. Yeah. Honestly, the salmon suit would have looked fantastic. Oh. So excited for this new generation of fashion in Thunder Bay. And speaking yeah. of this next generation, the Canadian women's hockey team has seen their next generation of stars during this tournament. We've got everything to get you set for the quarterfinal matchup tonight after the break. <laughs> 